Hey there, and welcome to this week's edition of Clean Technica's news broadcast. And actually, this broadcast is going to be a bit different because uh, last week we obviously had the Tesla Q1 investor call, the report, and there is a lot of news that came from that. And there is a ton of other news that it has nothing to do with Tesla that got buried underneath. And so you've probably already seen the Tesla news, and we're exploring an option of making that a separate video later this week. But all that stuff that got buried, that is what we really want to cover this week. So let's get to those stories. Fossil fuels. Coal is finally being thrown out of the energy mix. In this week's news, both Sweden and Austria have closed their last coal power plant. And in the case of Sweden, it actually closed two whole years early. But unfortunately, we're still pretty far away from getting rid of coal entirely, and nobody puts that better than this map by Beyond Coal. Tons of coal plants in Europe alone. These have already been shut down, are being phased out, or are being retired. However, these do not have a retirement plan, in which case Germany, the Czech Republic, and Poland have the most that they have yet to close. And these are the ones under construction or are planned, in which case Turkey is by far the worst offender. However, the really sad news is that all of the stuff in Europe that is under construction and development makes up just 1.5% of the coal being planned and built around the world. Personally, when it comes to coal, I'm just not all that worried. All the coal plants around the entire world right now are already uneconomical to operate, meaning that more could have been earned had they invested in renewable options. And there are estimates that by 2030, 50 to 90% of all the coal plants around the world will cost not just more to build, but just it'll cost more to operate them than to replace them with renewable options. In this world, money talks. No money, no coal plant. Also, there is a lot of other pressure to go green. Now, here's a funny story. China actually has more coal plants than it needs, and it keeps building more. All of this because of old laws that were introduced all the way back in the 80s to encourage coal. All of the plans out there, China's trying to cancel them left and right, but due to all kinds of government inefficiencies, it takes a lot of time and construction continues. Now, all of these plans that do get built, uh, they'll just run a par part of their capacity and will never be fully utilized. Then there's also the International Energy Agency. They said that the outbreak could wipe out demand for fossil fuels. Here's a quote from their report. CO2 emissions fell more than the energy demand as the most carbon-intensive fuels experienced the largest declines in demand during the first quarter of 2020. Now, for a while, people have been saying that we shouldn't just return to normal after this whole pandemic. I somehow didn't think much was going to come of that. I was pretty much convinced that people were going to make excuses like we have greater things to deal with right now. But I was actually really pleasantly surprised by the European Union. They want to put becoming green at the center of their pandemic recovery plan. Here's what they said. Now is a good time to reflect how a regulatory framework, including tax systems, can better support a more sustainable and resilient future. Then in another quote, getting rid of fossil fuel subsidies while lowering taxes on electricity can nudge us in the right direction, without putting too much pressure on the consumers. If the EU gets rid of the 200 billion euros worth of subsidies for oil, coal and natural gas, that would be huge. Not only would that help Europe move away from fossil fuels, but all that money can also be used to help get the economy going again. Climate change. When you think of forest fires, you obviously realize it was dry and that's probably why it happened. And so when it comes to the Amazon rainforest, you might not immediately think, hey, that's going to catch fire. But actually, uh, the Amazon rainforest is going through a bit of a dry period. Now, it's not a severe drought, but it's drier. And the point that the new report of satellite data is trying to make is that there's an increased chance for forest fires. Both NASA and the Brazilian National Institute for Space Research point out that stressed climate conditions, uh, such as higher temperatures, uh, drier soil, and depleted groundwater are the cause of the problem here. Now, combine that with the fact that uh, environmental protections have been scaled back by political agendas, and you get a pretty risky situation here. Chademo Charging standard Chademo just announced the third version of their charging protocol. Now, while Chademo is not very popular in the US or in Europe, it's actually very popular in China and in Japan. Now, what is new with their charging standard? Uh, there are two things that really stand out. First is that the charging capacity can exceed 500 kilowatt. Now, by how much remains a bit unclear. 
they did float around the number of 900 kilowatts somewhere like like somewhat like a year ago when they were talking about their plans for version 3, whether it can actually go that high, we don't know. The other thing that really stands out is that power flow can now be bi-directional, meaning not only can you uh, charge your car, which is the standard feature, but you can also use your car as a power wall. Now, in emergency situations, this is great, and they demonstrated this with a Nissan Leaf powering a 7-Eleven, I think this was in Japan. The problem is that to really take advantage of this, you kind of need to have a smart grid. Because if you have solar panels and you're generating more power uh, throughout the day than you need, you kind of need your car to be connected to the house in order to store that energy. And if it's at the office, then what use is it? Without a smart grid to compensate saying, okay, you made extra electricity here, now just take electricity from here and we're even. Without that kind of thing, it's kind of useless. But it could come one day. And in that case, Chidema would be very useful. Ford. Today we actually have two Ford stories, and the first has to do with Lincoln and Rivian. Uh, their all-electric SUV uh, that was going to be based on Rivian's technology has been cancelled. Now, they did say that a different vehicle, and I'm going to guess here and say it's a pickup truck, has not been cancelled. Uh, or at least they say it has not been cancelled. The word that they use here is that an alternative vehicle is still in the pipeline. What that means? Leave your guess down in the comments below. In the other Ford story this week, they announced a new vehicle, and it's also a Mustang, but a Cobra Jet. Basically, this vehicle has the same design as its current internal combustion engine Mustangs. Personally, I like the 2010 design more, but unlike the Mustang Mach-E, this vehicle has 1,400 horsepower, 1,100 pounds of torque, and can basically go from 0 to 170 miles in just 8 seconds. That, by the way, is also how long it takes the car to complete a quarter mile run. For the record, Tesla's next generation Roadster claims to do that in 8.8 .8 seconds. But with the SpaceX performance package, who knows? So far, it seems that Ford does not actually plan to sell this vehicle to the public. Although I'm really wondering why, because I'm fairly sure there are quite a few people that like racing that would love to buy this, or some at least. Even at a premium price. Mercedes-Benz. Mercedes-Benz has officially given up on his hydrogen fuel cell car dreams. Now, amongst the Clean Technica authors, we actually refer to it as fuel cells, since the idea of a hydrogen electric car is a bit of a fool's errand. Now, Mercedes actually already produced a hydrogen fuel cell SUV, the GKC F-Cell. But basically, they're going to stop production, as well as all plans for future hydrogen vehicles. The adoption is just going way too slowly, and really, it shouldn't be all that surprising. I don't know about the most current prices, but just a few years ago, the cost to build a hydrogen station cost $2 million. Imagine having to build those all over the world. Uh, an electric car charger, on the other hand, is way cheaper. I don't know about most chargers, but when it comes to a Tesla supercharger, they say the price is somewhere around $200,000 uh, for eight stalls. Now, that price could be a bit higher, could be a bit lower. We've seen uh, all kinds of numbers there. But... In any case, it, that's still way cheaper than a hydrogen station, and it can be used by way more vehicles than hydrogen. Oh right, another thing that hasn't helped adoption, the fact that in Europe there are only 300 hydrogen fuel stations, and already a couple have blown up. Kia. So in the beginning of March, Kia introduced this new concept vehicle. An all-electric SUV based on the eGMP Chasis. It's the Hyundai Group electric vehicle platform. In today's news, two Kia executives have revealed that the vehicle will have a 300 mile range, as well as be able to recharge within 20 minutes using a high power DC charger. It will appear in the US in 2021, but it might actually make its appearance in Europe before it actually reaches the US. Now, just so you understand, the current Kia e Nero vehicle already has a range of 282 miles, so the increase isn't huge, but every bit helps. Also, uh, the current vehicle already completely eliminates range anxiety. When I drove the Hyundai Kona EV, which is based on the same platform, range was not an issue. So I'm pretty curious how this new SUV will improve on the previous generation. By the way, speaking of Hyundai... Hyundai. Remember that prophecy model that Hyundai announced during the virtual version of the Geneva Motor Show? Here's an image of it. Well, in an interview given to Auto Express, uh, an executive has actually revealed that this vehicle will replace the current Hyundai Ioniq, which will then be discontinued. Now, uh, for more quotes about what this vehicle will be like, make sure to also visit our article on cleantechnica.com. Nissan. 
Then there's also a bit of news from Nissan. Now, uh, in last week's news show, I already mentioned the Nissan Aria concept vehicle. But in this week's news, we also uh, got the first indications that this vehicle won't just stay a concept, as Nissan filed these design patents. And they look remarkably similar to the concept Aria vehicle. What do you guys think? Is this it? CO2. Now here is the most fascinating story of the day. You know how sometimes when you get stuck in a room full of people, it gets stuffy, you start falling asleep, it all starts to seem boring. It's as if your brain just stops functioning. Well, it's not just a room, it's actually all about CO2. In fact, without good ventilation, uh, the CO2 levels in a room rise to approximately 1,400 parts per million. Now remember that number, it's going to be important later on. So, just to give you some perspective, the world's atmosphere currently is at 400 parts per million, which is unprecedented. Basically, throughout the last 800,000 years, it used to fluctuate between 200 to 300, and sometimes it could even jump from 200 to 300, but this jump would take a couple thousand years. However, this current jump from 300 to 400 took just 100 years, which is really, it is unprecedented. And what's important is that the IPCC report currently projects that by 2100, that level could get as high as 900 parts per million. What you might not know is that the CO2 levels inside are always going to be higher than the ones outside, it's just basic physics. But according to a new study, what we now found out is that if the atmosphere outside will be at 900 parts per million, then always inside it will be at least 1400 parts per million. Remember that number from earlier? The second thing that we learned from that study is that at those CO2 levels, our capacity for complex thoughts and our ability to carry out complex tasks is reduced by a whopping 50%, which is really something I wish someone had told my middle school history teacher before now. But actually such high levels of CO2 can reduce our capacity for simple thoughts and simple tasks by 25% as well. Now, I'll be honest, I can't exactly imagine what exactly they mean by that. Would we be less efficient at doing the dishes? Or uh, is it like, you know, when you f are about to do something, then you realize you forgot what you were about to do? Do you have that more often? And while this was not part of the original study, the conclusion that I have to draw from this is that anywhere that we carry out complex thoughts and tasks are going to need some kind of CO2 scrubbers or ventilation that uh, filters CO2. And that won't be pretty. Really, uh, life on Mars is starting to sound less terrible each time. Xpeng P7 The Xpeng P7 has just been launched and it has some truly fascinating features. Now, there are three variants. There is an entry-level version at $32,000 that has 353 miles of range. Then there is a middle option, which is actually a rear-wheel drive uh, that starts at $36,000 and has 439 miles of range. Um, then there's also a performance version that starts at $48,000, but the range is actually unknown. Uh, either it's the same as the middle option or it's going to be announced later, it remains a bit unclear. But what we do know is that the performance version can go from 0 to 60 in just 4.8 seconds. And for the price, that is really quite a lot of functionality. Um, what we also know is that the vehicle has fast charging and it can recover 120 kilometers of range in just 10 minutes. Now the 438 miles of range is uh, counted using the NEDC system and you know it's be it's known for being a bit optimistic but the fact that it is more than what Tesla has for the long range model 3 that's what true is truly fascinating that any vehicle that's not a Tesla built by a Chinese company for a Chinese market has that much range that has never been done before so this is definitely a first. Xpeng already sold 16,000 electric SUVs last year, uh, which is basically a fourth of what Tesla sells uh, in SNX. And that's actually quite a lot. And Xpeng, they're getting a ton of stuff right. The, the, on, on the interior, it has this big touchscreen, no buttons, over-the-air updates. It looks awesome. In fact, years ago, news broke uh, that this new company was practically copying Tesla in every way. And when you look at this UI image, it definitely is a copy, but personally, I actually like this Xpeng version of the design more than Tesla's. Now, there is a bit of a snafu where Xpeng may or may not have stolen the Tesla Autopilot um, source code. Now, it's an ongoing matter, so I'm not going to comment whether they plotted to obtain it illegally or not. But basically, what I think is it's been years ago, 
And at this point, autopilot is a lot more advanced than it was back then, and it's going to get more advanced as time goes on. So really, I think the most important thing is the more EVs out there, the better. And personally, I'd love a test ride of the X-Bank P7, as well as their SUV. And that was it for this week's broadcast. We hope that you guys liked it. And if you did, please consider sharing it. Our news broadcast is still relatively new. And if you'd send along to your friends that care about clean tech, we'd appreciate it. Also, giving this video a thumbs up can help us along. Now, everything that we cover in this new show, we also try to write articles about. And links to those can be found in the video description down below, as well as in this corner here. That little information icon, if you open it, all of the articles will be appearing there. Other than that, uh, I usually wish you guys a happy weekend, uh, but, you know, the weekend is almost over here, so I'm going to wish you guys a wonderful weekend. Till next time, see ya.